on the, sorry, I've got to stand on my toes to get to this. <laughs> I'm on the steering group of the Edinburgh People's Festival. It's okay, it'll suit the tall guy, so I'll just, I'll just stand on my toes, it's okay. Um, our debate tonight is A Nation Decides on Independence for Scotland. Uh, and we've got two esteemed speakers, I've got to introduce you to them in a minute. Um, but the blurb on the programme suggests that this is uh, an occasion for some flighting. And you all know what flighting is, don't you? Um, flighting is defined as a ritual, poetic exchange of insults. <laughs> <laughs> Practiced mainly between, or between the 5th and 6th centuries. Um, and the exchanges can become extremely provocative, often involving the accusations of cowardice, cowardice <laughs> or sexual perversion. <laughs> But not tonight. Okay, I can promise you that we'll have a passionate, articulate debate, but we'll not have any sexual perversions. I really don't. Ask us the audience. <laughs> um, I want to now introduce you the two speakers on my right and left. Who's going to speak first? Um, on my right is Kevin Williamson. Kevin's a writer by profession. Um, he also edits Bella Caledonia and he's the Vice Chair of Scottish Independence Convention and he's going to speak for the motion that Scotland, uh, will, the working class people of Scotland will be better off under an independent Scotland. Okay, I'm going to give each of the speakers 15 minutes and um, then I'm going to stop them. 15, 20 minutes, okay, then I'll stop them. And because what we really want is a kind of lively debate, lively, passionate, Fighting with the audience, not just the two guys on the side. Um, I might just introduce Neil Willem here as well. Uh, Neil um, Finlay is the Lodians List MSP, is a Labour councillor in Falk House before he became an MSP. Um, he used to be a bricklayer, he tells me. Then he became a teacher and uh, he described himself as a proud left wing socialist. And he enjoys going to the pub with his pals. I think. Okay, we can probably indulge in that pastime. Okay, without further ado, let's, let's go, um, Kevin. Thanks, when I first read the piece of the evening news, uh, I was to trade crude insults with Neil. <coughs> I, don't, I don't have any insults. And the ones I have got, you know, they're pretty tame. So I'm not going to bother doing that. I set my own rules. I'm, even what you've all said, I'm just going to do what I feel like. That's my approach to flying. Look, oh, if I call you a bastard, can we just get over it? Like that? <laughs> that's it, finished. That's all, the, that's all the crude insults finished. The reason why, I was reading the thing about the evening news, and it's also partly because I was watching uh, Newsnight the other night, and I thought, there's something going wrong here with the independence debate. They're saying it's going to be crude insults. And it's when, what put me off this idea, because it seemed quite a nice idea, was when I read the editorial. It said, Perhaps we need a more radical approach, maybe a little role playing by the participants. And I just thought, you fuckers. <laughs> this is the most important decision Scotland's ever going to make in our history, and you want us to turn it into some kind of <coughs> pantomime for the media. This is not going to happen. We've got, we've got, it's an insult really, because of the scale of this decision, we've got two years and whatever we decide is going to affect generations to come. This is a fact. The stakes are high. And let's be really clear about what the stakes are. The stakes are about power. Nothing else, it's about power. It's about access to power and the democratization of power. This is what the independence debate's about. It's not, because without access to power, you can't have fairness. You can't have justice. You can't have any of the issues that would probably bind most of the people in this room together, whether you're on the pro or anti-independence side of the debate. And what I mean by power, this is all we're making in 2014. This is a decision. We want to transfer power from London to Scotland. And when you look at power as it exists in London, there's a problem. The power that exists in London is a power that's controlled almost entirely now by the city of London, the large corporations, the military industrial base to the British state, the multimedia uh, the moguls like Rupert Murdoch, the rich property speculators, and the banks. That's where power resides in, in London. Westminster doesn't come into it anymore. 
That elite control all three political parties and they dance to the tune of big power, which only represents about 1% of the population, if that. So we've got a problem here. And, and if anyone wants to dispute that, what are the effects of this corruption, this total corruption of power, is that the three political parties know that they have no power anymore. Westminster doesn't have any power. And that's why they've given up. We saw recently in the expenses scandal, they've just decided to fill their boots instead. We've got a situation where even the Home Secretary is, is you know, bath, bath plugs for 79p. You know, she's like put through porn tapes so her husband can knock one off in a hotel. We've got a situation where even the, the, the Alistair Darling is exchanging houses and making money from this. We've got a situation where it's corrupted everybody. Now, we've got a chance here of taking power from there and putting it in the, hands, in the hands of the people. And all we've got to do is vote yes to do that. And that's what this referendum is about, essentially. You know, Alison Darling made a point, and uh, it was a fair point. He said that when they launched the No campaign, there's no turning back. You know, this is it. There's no turning back. And it was one of these moments when you just thought, no shit, Joe. Because you look at India, Canada, Australia, America, Ireland, no country that's ever voted for independence has ever wanted to turn back because they've all seen the benefits of running their own country for themselves and by themselves. There's never been a turning back. So that's what this is about. You know, if we vote yes, it's an independent Scotland forever. And that's what's at stake. And that's why I, I'm not going to trivialise this. This is really big. This is affects us and our children and children to come. We need an honest debate. But before we can have an honest debate, and this is a plight, if there's anybody in the SNP thinking I'm going to patronise them here in Stoke and Stoke you've got another thing coming because we need to wise up here. Because before we can have an honest debate, a self-evident truth has to be established. And it's not been established yet. And it's a simple truth. It's a uncontroversial truth and it's incontestable. We need to understand the difference between 2014 and 2016. It might seem straightforward, but the penny's not yet dropped. And the implications of this understanding is going to change the nature of this debate in the next two years, and not only change the nature of it, as I hope to explain, I believe it will change the outcome. 2014, we're going to have a vote on whether Scotland becomes an independent country. In other words, do we transfer power from London to Scotland? It's a debate about democracy and a decision we made on democracy. In 2016, we're going to have the first general election, if the vote goes yes, to what will be an independent state. It will be an independent country elected its first ever government. That's the two differences. One is about democracy, the other is about policy. In other words, the normalization of politics. And I got a Mandy Rhodes here, the editor of Hollywood Magazine. Okay, right, anyway, I'm just going to tear her apart. <laughs> I was hoping, I did warn her, I said I would use this. This morning I saw her do a, a tweet. With two years to indie ref, it would be good to hear what the SNP would do on banking or welfare reform more than what they will do about a nuclear alliance. Now, on the surface, that seems like a reasonable request. But when you look at it in the context of 2014 and 2016, it's political illiteracy. And it's a political illiteracy that goes right through the entire media, and politicians are actually encouraging it on both sides, unfortunately. Because the obvious question is, why are you asking the SNP to explain their 2016 policy manifesto four years before the election takes place? And why are you asking the SNP but not the other parties? Because they're all, I mean, as far as I know, the SNP won't be standing in 2016 in an uncontested election. There's going to be at least five more parties, four or five more parties who are represented in Hollywood, plus smaller parties like the SSP who will be trying to get seats in Hollywood. In Hollywood. Hollywood. So you have to ask, this is, not, this is not trivial, this is about an assumption. 
an assumption which has gone unchallenged in the media so far. And basically, the assumption is that if it, come 2016, whatever policies the SNP have will be the policies of an independent Scotland. And that's fundamentally incorrect. And it's a, it's a lie that's been perpetuated by the nature and the frame, framing of this debate. And that's something that I hope to challenge. And the implications of this for the SNP, by the way, are only just beginning to be understood by the, from the government downwards. Because let's look at it. The SNP have got a democratic mandate from 2011 to 2016. That mandate has got two factors to it. One, they've got a mandate to hold a referendum on independence. And two, they've got a mandate to run Scotland until the elections of 2016. In other words, from 2014, if, the SNP, if we vote yes, the SNP have a mandate for the transition to democracy in 2016. In other words, the SNP have got a mandate to decide the head of state, NATO, Trident, currency, the EU, taxation, public services, foreign policy, defence, etc. But that mandate runs out on the first election in 2016. And after that, the SNP, I think, will either disintegrate, break apart, or they will become a normalised party to vote of independence as part of their because it'll be, it'll be settled. And therefore, you're going to have five political parties or more going into the election to decide the fate of Scotland. In other words, the SNP do not decide Scotland, what it's going to be an independence. None of the SNP policies on NATO matter. None of them matter. On the monarchy, they don't matter. Because, for all I know, Labour will win that election in 2016, or it may be a, a coalition government with the Greens or the SSP, and they'll decide on NATO. They'll decide on the currency. They'll decide on the level of public services. They'll decide on every single issue. And this still has me cottoned on to the editor of Hollywood magazine and all the other editors of the newspapers. It will, but it hasn't cottoned on yet. Because the SNP's mandate runs out in 2016, and then, for the first time in Scottish history, power is transferred to the people of Scotland. And this is a big difference when the people become sovereign. I believe when this difference between 2014 and 2016, when the penny drops, kaboom, it's going to send not one, but two Exocet missiles right through the No campaign, and it's going to blow it right out the water, because their entire campaign so far has been based on two premises. One, attacking the SNP and what they're going to deliver for independence, quite often personalising it on Alex Salmond, and two, they've been fighting a campaign on identity, Scottishness versus Britishness, and how we might be both. Identity is irrelevant. What we're voting on is democracy, not identity. Demo your identity is fixed. There's nobody in this room who's going to change their identity in the next two years, and I doubt if anyone in Scotland's going to switch their identity, their national identity, in the next two years. It's a total red herring, and it's totally irrelevant. Now, the problem with the No campaign is to put all their eggs in the basket of fighting on Britishness and Scottishness and how we're better together being British. And when these get exposed, what are they going to be left with? To date, fear-mongering on how we're too small, we're too poor, blah, blah, blah. The same rubbish we've heard for decade after decade. And this is why I think the nature of the debate is going to change dramatically when the penny drops in 2014 and 2016. As I've explained, uh, the question of identity will resolve itself. You know, if people want to consider themselves British, they can. Nobody cares. If people want to consider themselves Scottish, nobody cares. It's all about taking democracy into the hands of the people of Scotland, who include 10% are English. So the idea this is all about Scottish people. It's about democracy for the people that live and work in Scotland. And, and, and here's the important part. This is where I would challenge Neil. Once it's about democracy, it becomes about possibilities. The possibilities that are inherent with democracy. Because, let's face it, we're both going to be putting forward both sides. What are the possibilities for an independent Scotland? What are the possibilities inherent within staying in the Union? Now, I would challenge the No campaign to stand up and put forward what they think 
it's the possibilities economically, socially and democratically for progress in Scotland within the Union over the next five or ten years. And I'll tell you what, if, if anybody stands up and says we're going to be living in a more democratic country in Britain in five, ten years, we're going to be living in a country that's more uh, prosperous, less, e less, unequal, less inequality, less poverty, I would laugh my face off. And I think most people would laugh their face off because it's just not credible. It's never happened in 50 or 60 years. It's gone down and down and Britain is sinking. Britain is sinking very clearly. And if you look around Scotland, what you see on the question of the social issues, for example, 1% of this entire country are heroin addicts. That's a legacy of union. We've got a, a country where it's really screwed up. People are angry, they're frustrated. We've got mass unemployment. We've got child poverty on a scale that's not been tackled by the last 50 or 60 years of union. So we've got to say to ourselves, that's the legacy of union. That's what we've got to challenge if we want to go into our possibilities. I would say this, none of this is fact. None of this can be said to definitely happen. But the, ask yourself this, if we become an independent state, we have full power in Edinburgh, we have the sovereignty of the people, what barriers are there then to the reindustrialization of Scotland? What barriers are there to putting real power, real resources into local communities, to build in homes right the way across Scotland, because nothing's getting built at the moment, social housing. What's the possibilities of tackling the, the banks who control the wealth, who siphon it off to offshore tax havens? We saw recently $21 trillion has been siphoned off to tax, tax havens. What can we do to bring the banks under our control? What can we do to reimagine democracy itself? What can we do to create a country that acts as a, a bastion of peace, an agent for peace, rather than sends its troops to fight in foreign countries that can get rid of nuclear weapons? What's to stop us from having a written Bill of Rights, a constitution that safeguards our rights? And if you look at it that way, you tell me what's to stop us. Because all we do is we elect the political parties that will carry that through. There is no going to be any barrier. We've got a transparent government being developed a brand new, modern, 21st century democracy that we're about to create if we vote yes. There are no barriers. There's no barriers to social progress. It's a clean sheet. It's like what John, Jim Kelman said when he won the Booker Prize. You start with a blank page and you fill it. And that's what we've got the possibility of doing from 2014 onwards. And the last point, I see the time is running in. The last point I'll make is, what kind of legacy are we going to leave if we're, we remain part of the Union? What kind of legacy do we leave if we're an independent Scotland? Now, I would argue that we've got the possibility of leaving a legacy, and this might not seem huge at this point, of clean water and clean energy for our children and surplus. Because I believe these are going to be the two most contested commodities in the 21st century. Any country that's got a surplus in that it's leaving something special for the children, as well as a democratized country. So I'm just putting the case for a broad brush. I haven't gone in for statistics. I'm not going to argue over whether we're going to be 500 pounds better off or 1,000 pounds worth. This is tedious arguments. It limits imagination, and it limits debate, and it creates a framework for basically no change is possible, yet change is possible. And this is the reality of an independent Scotland's possibilities. There's real change possible, and we have to choose fear versus hope, status quo versus change, that whole identity nonsense versus democracy. And I think that once the ideas start to unravel, and once this whole ideas of you know negativity gets wedged into its own little corner, I'm pretty confident that people in Scotland are going to go for progress rather than regression and the status quo. established in the 5th or 6th century because many people in the Labour Party think that I've always been in the 5th or 6th century. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit I will continue to remain there. Um, I was going to tell you a story about, uh, given that you spoke about this flighting 
thing, whatever it is. It reminded me of the dangers of speaking in public. And then, um, uh, uh, for my sins, I used to work in a, a toilet roll factory in Livingston. And it was a, the dreariest place on earth. It wasn't your luxury Andrex, it was your shiny stuff that you used to get in school, that kind of stuff. And it was run by the dreariest people you've ever met, the most unimaginative managers. And what they used to do at the start of each financial year was they used to get the staff and the salespeople, salespeople, like people did buy that stuff, and they used to get them in for a pep talk and try and get us all motivated up for the financial year. And it was usually at half three on a Friday, and everybody was trying to go out for a pint. And they were so bad that this year they decided to get a motivational speaker in. And I was an American guy, of course, you know, so they get dragged out to the, 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 their office on the factory floor. They go in and listen to this guy. They came in and he's giving me, all right, we're ready to sell, we're ready to produce. And just as he's getting in, he spill, there's an air conditioning unit making a buzzing noise in the background. He says, hey, how are you stopping? Is this thing annoying you as much as me? One of the guys at the back went, no, mate, I think you just edge it. <laughs> so, the dangers of speaking in public. Uh, Anyway, thanks to Vaughan and thanks to the organisers of the Edinburgh Eagles Festival uh, for organising this debate, which has already been very lively uh, uh, and interesting. And um, I think the, we have to start um, getting into the, the issues relating not just to the country's future, the other people's future, but the impact of constitu constitutional change uh, on our class. Because by God, we need people on the left to start. Uh, influencing that debate and moving it in a different direction from where it is currently drifting. It will be up to us, whatever party you're from, to bring a different analysis to the debate and in particular to bring a class analysis that has been almost entirely absent, I would say, at the moment. And um, I think before kicking off, I think it's important to remind ourselves that most of us in here, I would reckon, probably want the same thing. We probably want similar outcomes for our people. I suspect the majority of us in the room would like to see a socialist Scotland where the redistributive, we have redistributive, redistributive if, I can, if I can say it, policies that share the country's wealth and power amongst our people where poverty and inequality is eradicated. And I hope that we don't just want this for Scotland, I hope we want it for England, Wales, Ireland, and everywhere else through the globe. And the debate. Tonight, therefore, isn't so much about competing visions for Scotland. It's rather how do we best get there. Now, let me be frank, the 2011 political uh, election was a political earthquake in Scotland, um, delivering not just a majority government, but bloody hell, a majority nationalist government. You know, a result inconceivable to anybody waving the most fleeting interest in the political process. And for, for my party, the Labour Party, the result was a disaster. 29% of the vote, 37 MSPs. In fact, it was so bloody bad that I got elected. Um, I don't think the powers that be saw that coming, but mind you, neither did I. But, uh, however, as a wise man once said, we are where we are, and the SNP government will host its referendum in 2014, uh, its referendum on independence in 2014. Or will it? Will it be a referendum on independence? Because is that what the SNP government are really proposing, or is it something entirely different? Because independence should be a simple enough concept to understand. All powers to be transferred to the Scottish Parliament, all taxes raised in Scotland, and all money spent from within Scotland. It's a kind of easy concept to grasp, you think. Well, I'm now told an independent Scotland will have the Queen, God bless her as the head of state. We'll have the currency union, the sterling zone apart of that's a new one of me. The Bank of England, yes, England, would be the lender of last resort to regulate. Or according to others, we'll have the, in an independent Scotland that will have to join the Euro because of the new rules on member states joining. And we know that the Scottish Government continues to refuse to, uh, uh, refuse to release any advice they've got on joining the Euro. Currency that brought the Greeks, a proud country that brought the world democracy back to an era the unelected dictatorship run by the Eurocrats and central bank placement. So economically we're either going to have interest rates in independent Scotland controlled by a foreign power, England, or if we completely take leave of our senses, 
our economy at the mercy of the European Central Bank, or as it's more commonly known, Germany. Or maybe, just maybe, as SNP MSP Christina McKelvey infamously and seriously suggested, we'll join the yen. Now, she said that. Meanwhile, back at planet Earth, Christina, as the mask slips on the Scottish Government's economic vision for Scotland, we see, we see what's being proposed, and I have to ask what the position of the left in Scotland is in all of this. What do the various strands of leftist opinion, um, how do they view, or how much do they have in common with the SNP's vision of a Scotland, dominated still by the power of capital, and we are further weakened and divided trade union movement? A free enterprise Scotland, with low taxes, deregulation, and a Scotland where power is further centralised. How is that society attractive to socialists, Greens, and leftist nationalists? So in my contribution, what I'm going to pose is a series of questions that I'd like you to very seriously consider and come up uh, with your own, and then come up with your own opinion. And in doing so, I feel compelled to speak about the SNP, not for tedious party political reasons or plain old not passion, if you like, but um, because of what is being proposed. So ask yourself how you would view an independent Scotland that will see the corporation tax rate cut to less than that of Ireland. When, you know, when Alex Salmond went to California recently, <coughs> prior to donning his Rupert the Bear trousers uh, to see the Premier in the cartoon Brave, um, and I must ask him, what is it with Scottish First Ministers in bad fashion when they go to America? I don't know, I need to get got one on the job, I think. But anyway, um, he toured the California, Californian corporate giants, and the BBC were in tow. And what three things did he take to sell Scotland? Well, um, predictably, he took whiskey and tap. But more importantly, he took the promise of a large cut in corporate taxes. Can I say, for instance, the UK corporation tax rate has already been cut to 25%. Now the government want to cut it to 12.5% or more likely 10% lower than Ireland. Why? Because we're told it will make us more competitive. Now, the theory is that you cut corporate taxes, it will create wealth, which in turn creates jobs and growth. But that's straight out of the Ronald Reagan book, A Trickle Down Economics. And if this, is, this approach was so successful, such a great reason, you would expect the most successful economies in Europe to be already doing it. So can I ask, what's the corporation tax in Germ uh, rate in Germany? Is it 5%, 10%, 12%? Mm -hmm. It's 29.8%. France is 33%, and across the SNP's beloved Scandinavia, the average is 26%. Now, if you're a nationalist, it's logical that you want powers over all taxes, corporate taxes included. But if you're a socialist or a social democrat, this should be an anathema to you. You can't create Scandinavian levels of social services while practicing the economics of Friedman. And the result of that will be that we'll suck hundreds of millions out of our already ailing Scottish economy and engage in a deep dive to the bottom. Because neighbouring countries will inevitably follow suit. And all that will happen is we'll be the fat cats fat at the expense of the services provided for working people. No one, no one on the left should have any trouble with such nonsense. And how do you feel? How do you feel about the council tax freeze that's crippling local services? How is it affecting your community, your family? Because we continue to see thousands of jobs lost in local government. And these are not the highly paid public officials that the tabloids love to profile. These are the people that clean our streets, they look after our elderly, they teach our kids. These are the services we should be cherishing, not destroying. And the worst thing about the freeze is that it promotes the idea that somehow taxation is bad. When we know that progressive taxation is absolutely critical for the essential society that I'm sure we all want, and for the decent society that we all want to see created. And what galls me in particular about that is that there are decent people, I'm sure people in this room, who on, on the left of the SNP, who sit and point to Westminster cuts as the cause of the disastrous decline in public services, and yet won't speak up 
about how the council tax policy is contributing to the disaster. Do you know what? I've got to tell you one thing. Since 2007, not one SNP MSP has voted against their party, deliberately voted against their party back on any issue. Any issue. Now, when are they going to get a bit of backbone and stand up for themselves? They've got a rigidly imposed <coughs> discipline that Blair and New Labour could only have dreamt of. Uh, <laughs> 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you may laugh, but in any issue, I would guarantee you that you would have pe had people in the Labour Party who would have stood up and said, no, don't do that. Yes, they were ostracised. Malcolm Chisholm sitting there and he would have been one of them. Good people like that. But we have had nobody in the SNP since 2007 break with that. That's astonishing. And then we have the um, Scottish Future Trust uh, policy, which pretends its projects are not just a continuation of PFI, Labour's PFI, yes. Um, yet last month, the Scottish Future Trust won a clutchy awards. Great, what did it win awards for? Be the press promoter of the PPP projects in Scotland. We've got the small business bonus that gives rates only to businesses, and yet there is no evidence whatsoever that this is creating jobs uh, in our communities. And add to that the imminent new term for NATO, which I predict, well, I predict seriously will be followed by a partial uh, U-turn over Trident, maybe a full U-turn over Trident, questions over social security, border controls and the rest, uh, all the issues and that simple concept that I spoke about of independence just isn't this as simple after all. And I would suggest it's much less attractive, especially to people on the left. So ask yourself, is that your vision of independence? Because we have to be honest in this debate, folks. The Scotland vote was yes in 2014. I don't think it will be accompanied by a skipping and heel kicking Colin Fox entering Butte House as First Minister. I don't think it'll be Rosie Kane as the education minister scrapping jotters and computers and telling people to write their answers on their hand. And I don't think Kevin Williamson will be in charge of drugs policy, although it would be a very interesting celebrated party if it were. I must say on drugs, Kevin, you mentioned that heroin addiction is a legacy of the union. Heroin addiction is a legacy of capitalism. That's what it is. You only the union. Uh, if, if that happens in 2014, the reality is you're unlikely to hear, see a socialist, a green, or communist, or labour version of independence. You're much more likely to see an SNP version of independence. And that version will be the independence of Fergus Ewan and Mike Russell and the like. These people are these socialists. They're not even social democrats. They're Tories to their wealthy. <coughs> The, the soles of their well-heeled boots. That's, that's indisputable. <laughs> a few weeks ago, we saw the launch of the Yes campaign with some people in this room uh, in attendance. And I have to say it was a remarkable event, to say the least. We had far-right Tory venture capitalists like Peter Devine holding hands with the leader of the SSP. We had environmental campaigners um, singing Caledonia with climate change deniers. We had campaigners for tax justice high-fiving non-known tax evaders and we had Hollywood actors embracing Hollywood Zen-listers. It was a very bizarre uh, get-together. And all of them, this is the astonishing thing, all of them telling you that independence will deliver their version of Scotland. So, if we get independence, we can have independence with high taxes or maybe low taxes, with environmental protection or maybe the freedom to pollute in the name of growth. A republic, or maybe a monarchy. A state within the EU, a state standing on its own. A state using the pound, the euro, or I'm just waiting on the empty bars will be being uh, uh, proposed as the currency. Take your pick, jump on, aboard the independence bandwagon, because we can deliver for all of you. Well, within weeks, days, we had Colin, Patrick Harvey, Martin McDonald, and others crunching into reverse gear, attempting to distance themselves be one or other elements of the campaign. And now we're told that SNP MSPs are not only allowed to say the word independence, whatever next. What about the other side of the debate? Well, we had that 
man, up, that nice man, Alistair Darling, and he had tea and some other so nice home bacon provided by his wife at his flat in Pilton. It is Pilton that Alistair stayed in, isn't it? And uh, along, along with Comrade McCletchy, we do get Alexander, and some of you have never heard of from the Lib Dems, but I'm probably, he's probably never heard of him either. And um, this was followed by the launch of the Better Together campaign at Newton Napier University, where we were treated to the stirring rhetoric of the said Mr. Darling. And then Annabelle Goldie playing Mrs. Merton, interviewing normal Scots about their support for the beloved union. Why any self respect in normal Scott would be speaking to Annabelle Goldie? I have no idea. But um, in the PR war that is the <coughs> referendum campaign, I'm afraid from both sides, going to be treated to more of this stuff and it's going to be a long journey to 2014 I can assure you. So where should the left stand in this debate? Well I, I strongly believe that we need to get away from all the process led bullshit that's been going on. All this stuff about one or two questions and is it one or two referendums and votes for X pass and all that guff and start to address what can Scotland we actually want to see. We need to influence the debate, we need to drag it onto our terms because it will be dominated, if not, it will be dominated by the power, the capital, and the vested interests who act as its agents. And that's what's happening within the governing party at the moment. They're being dragged to the right, uh, it's just by the big business community, much in the same way as Blair allowed himself to be. And you can tell a lot about a person from their friends. And who, who are the SNP's chums right now? It's Sir George Matheson, it's Sir Brian Souter, it's Tom Farmer. Angus Gosser, all these people, ask yourself, are they promoting independence because they believe it will deliver socialism, social democracy, or even environmentalism? Why is it that big business is now comfortable with the prospect of independence? And for those who seek to change your constitutional arrangements, and I'm one of them, then we have to start by explaining why we're seeking those changes in the first place. Well, if we look at the current Constitutional arrangements, we see it dominated, see UK dominated by the forces in neoliberalism. And the, the question has to be asked, therefore, would that cease simply because we erect a border and change the constitution, or do we need more fundamental changes to the way power and wealth is held? New Labour's time in office failed to challenge the dominance in capital, indeed, in many ways, caused it up to it, continuing with deregulated uh, economics and so called flexible labour markets. In the real world where we all live, that means low wages, restrictive trade unions, yeah, trade union laws, privatisation, and a tax to welfare state. Wasn't it all bad? And there was progress made with things like minimum wage, paternity leave, pension, tax credits, and all the rest of it. But a lot more could and should have been done. And if you look at the Westminster government at the moment, it's now enthusiastically redistributing wealth, but not in the direction that we want to see. They're funneling cash for the poor to the rich. If you think about the budget, the 50% 50p tax rate, and their diabolical welfare reforms and savage, savage austerity measures. That's a declaration of class war. Don't take, don't take my word for it. I'll ask you who's this quote from. It's a class war, and my class are winning, but they shouldn't be. Who said that? Warren Buffett, one of the richest investors in the world, and that applies to what's happening in Britain as well. Five minutes, five minutes to go. So, uh, <laughs> so in this climate, it would be easy to suggest that some on the left have that the answer to our problems is independence and the breakup, that the imperialist British state will somehow liberate the Scottish working class from oppressive London based capitalism, whilst others on the right suggest that an independent Scotland will be more competitive through reduced personal and corporate taxes evolved employment law and light touch business regulation. One thing's for sure, it can be both. So I hope that we can start to go into the real issues about local services, jobs, housing, education, health, and inequality and start shaping an influence in that debate. The left has to be at the forefront because we can't allow the dark forces of capital and big business, the uh, uh, big business community, the right wing think tanks, the corporate interests that dominate the debate. If we simply replace a group of right wing neoliberal bankers and policy makers in London were the same in Edinburgh, then that would be a disaster for working people in Scotland. And I would argue for working people throughout the UK because, you know, 82% of the large corporations who operate in Scotland 
or externally owned. The majority of the biggest employers in Scotland are listed on the UK stock exchange. Stock exchange. So, if we move towards independence, that will leave Scotland even less influence over those corporations than we have at present. For me, I have a vision of Scotland radically different uh, from what we see today. As the Scotland that aims to create full employment, Scotland has an industrial policy that seeks to build manufacturing, that, uh, the manufacturing that creates wealth, and a country where our renewables opportunities are owned by Spanish, French, and Italian multinational and venture capital firms who currently dominate, but are owned by com the community, by cooperatives, and by uh, public bodies who can use the surpluses for the services they provide. A Scotland where public services are valued and developed and not starved of funds. And the Barnett formula that operates in the moment has to be that currently performs a redistributive function based on need. How, if that is to go, are we to maintain public services and invest in the economy? We can't do that. We trickle down economics and it didn't work in the past and it won't work in the future. Um, we should be aiming for a society where public services remain the civilising force that they've been since the creation of the welfare state. And I spoke earlier about the council tax. I would freeze the council tax, but for the people at the bottom of the income scale, scale and those at the top would be paying much, much more. I think we should take a progressive stance, a principle stand on progressive taxation as your ticket to a fair and just society. And we have to deal, as Kevin said, with the scandal, the tax avoidance, 92 billion a year. And I have to ask, why is it that all levels of government continue to give contracts to companies who evade tax and use tax as tax havens? We should make it, one other thing, we should make it clear that the likes of Amazon, who not only avoid their tax responsibilities, but treat their workers like crap and are aggressively hostile to trade unions. They should not be welcome in Scotland. Um, I know my time is getting on, so I will uh, finish um, by saying, in conclusion, the, I left a copy of uh, the Red Paper Collective's uh, paper on power for Scotland's people. And I've been working with a group of trade unionists and labour movement activists, activists from across Scotland. <coughs> uh, our view is one of a Scotland sitting within a federal UK, with that incorporation tax played essentially to prevent tax competition. Uh, this would allow for UK wide redistribution to areas in most need, promoting the social and economic solidarity where uh, people in England and the other regions. It would avoid a race to the bottom. We would raise most income tax in Scotland to meet Scotland's needs, borrow and increase as an alternative to the PPP or the SFT, and the Parliament would have the powers to create publicly owned enterprises and promote cooperatives to build their industrial capacity. And crucially, we would maintain the unity of the UK trade union movement as the best equipped organisation for the defence of working people and check on the power of capital. Independence would weaken and diminish trade unions. And surely we have not forgot our old adage that unity is strength. Comrades, I base my politics around progress for our people. I see my fellow Scots first as human beings, not as an economic component. They're people who we learn from, we socialise with, we laugh, we cry with, and yes, we work with too, all of which helps build the community and society in which we live. I want a Scotland as a natural instinct to protect and strengthen the rights of working people, complemented by an active and vocal trade union movement supported by Civic Scotland. We, we need to start influencing the debate over the future direction of our country. And I would say independence is the simplistic answer to a complex question.
Well, we're talking about the last 20 years, okay? I would have supported, listened, given out his leaflets 20 years ago, right from the wall. Now, which is the Labour Party we're talking about that supports nuclear weapons, that supports the um, overriding economic um, interests of, if in fact we call it fundamental market, market. And that's why they cozy up to America. Okay? So I find it's not the SNP I'm voting for, it's for independence that makes it possible to get rid of nuclear weapons. It makes it possible. Actually, as Sarah Boyer, my MSP, said, to influence on the issue of nuclear weapons, the rest of the world, apart from England, where it would give a big boost to denuclearization to, um, and so on and so on and so forth. You wrote in quite a long letter. And uh, these are the big issues for the future. If the economy, but you're not talking about that. You're not a Scottish Labour Party, you're just part of the British Labour Party, okay? And they're steeped in the inheritance from when Britain was a colonial power and they think it's big and they think it's powerful. And it's, I know I'm talking about Blairism, but you can't get away from this fact that Blair was godfather to Murdoch's granddaughter, and as well as absolutely uh, committed to Americanism, not Scottishism. What I'm going to do, I'm going to get a few questions from the floor, and then I'm going to ask Kevin and uh, Neil to respond briefly. Ali, you next. I'll, I'll use us, Stanley Slovian. And uh, the last council elections, after the last council elections, the day after the last council elections, I've seen the future with Scotland if they do vote no and stay in the union. I've seen the future with the Labour Party. When the day after it, they announced in East Lothian that we've got a coalition with the Tories. You know what I mean? That says everything. I read Bevan called the Tories vermin. You know I, mean? I joined the Labour Party in 1977 and I left the Labour Party in 1990, I think 92 or 93, when they changed the constitution, when they changed it to actually being a socialist party on paper, at least, and to being what they wanted to be, which is a democratic party, like an American democratic party. So the future, if we vote no on that, the future, I can see the next Scottish government, if you like, in, in uh, 2016 being a Tory, Labour coalition, and didn't say it will only be because it, it is an East Lothian and it is in a lot of other council appointment. That's the future. Actions speak a lot louder than words. <laughs> I'm Andrew Lampson, I'm also a former Labour voter, but I, I stopped voting Labour in the first election that uh, took place of, of the party. Um, you, you, you say something interesting in, in the information you put out, which is um, to refer to the possibility of Scotland united, uh, a continental kingdom, with a federal system. I, I, I cannot, I have to say that I cannot actually see that um, the, the, the Westminster financial and, and political power centre has the potential to be the centre, the, the centre government of a federal system. In, in constitution and behaviour, it is effectively a city-state. And city-states do not give up their power to the wider population. So actually, yes, I think the only way that the UK as a whole is going to be democratised is if, is if power and influence is actually taken away from the centre of Westminster. And Scottish independence is a good first step to that. I'm a Kelly, I'm a, and you also a member of the Socialist Labour Party. Two things I want to bring to the party to share. Also, actually, here at the IS at Telford College. I think what um, I'm looking at from the Labour Party also in that. You know, I commend people like Kevin uh, who, who 
couple of years have been uh, open to, to reflection about their politics. But I think what those in the way to, uh, I think it's important that we don't get caught in a tribal dispute here with two great guests that we never get to see how long we have uh, We're trying to work out the, the most useful path to socialism, uh, and this is why we're talking about independence as possibly uh, about to that. But I think those people who are identifying independence as a possible route to social justice, and I think this is a malaise on the left generally, I mean, it's a council of despair. I think the people on the left who have uh, gravitated towards nationalism have done so out of, out of a hemorrhage in the confidence. Because nationalism, as we know, that's an instant spoken. Socialists have always been amenable to self-determination. And self-determination is only a stage of post on something much more important, which is class consciousness, which is a critique of capital. Uh, and what the left and the nationalist movement uh, in the the SNP not clarified yet is why a state that we assume that socialists would represent class interests in the other state, in Scotland, very different to, to a state down in London. That I commend everything we can once out of the for the future of our people, but it's, it's absolutely no clarity in why the following of the Scottish Parliament can represent any different class interest in one doing investments there. Capital does not expect borders. Mark said that 150 years ago, all that it saw in Nelson and Taylor doesn't expect culture, doesn't expect borders, doesn't expect anything. Unless we challenge that, then we'll just get we're getting caught in the side of the game, which I think is a symptom of our Thank you. I, say, um, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, 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 my purpose of being here, and I think Kevin was not, and I hope as well, was to get people on the left to start thinking about this type of country we want and how we can start. I, I firmly believe that it's up to people on the left of the SNP to strongly influence that party and take it in a direction the opposite of where that's going. And it's up to us in the Labour Party to do the same. Actually, we're starting to see that the debate in the SNP right now about NATO isn't actually a debate about NATO. I firmly believe it's a debate about the direction of the SNP is travelling. <coughs> and as, as Labour realised from its defeat that we have to move leftwards, the SNP is actually a bit behind. They're moving rightwards. And there's going to be a cross there. And, you know, so I think, I genuinely say this to nationalists, good left-wing nationalists, you have to start to influence the direction of that debate within your own party, because it's rapidly going the wrong way for me. Now, can I say a couple of things? I'm a member of the British Labour Movement, that, uh, right. that's what I'm a member of. And the difference between us and the, Amer and the American Democratic Party is that we are, the trade unions are still embedded within my party and the best uh, influence that we have within the party. My friend here mentioned coalitions and who was in the coalition to who. There are some very odd coalitions throughout Scotland. I was a councillor of West Lothian in opposition to an SNP Tory. I'm coalition. not an SNP. No, 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 Labour vote, we voted Labour. Absolutely. Nothing to do with the SNP. No, no, but what I'm saying is they're very odd coalitions. There's no other coalitions than the yes and no campaigns. By God, there's some strange bedfellows in there. Um, so, and the final thing I would say, because we want these bits to be brief, I'm sure, is that when people talk about um, bringing power back to Scotland, if, if we bring capitalism just a bit closer to home, it'll be okay. <clears throat> Power will still lie in the city of London. So without a federal government, you're actually taking a step back from power. You'll be giving up what little power and influence Scotland has got. So I actually think we'll be in a worse position if we go independent. Because the power of capital will still remain in the city of London. And you've got some influence, as little as we think we have, through a UK government. I enjoyed Neil's contribution, so I didn't go in for the flying, but I thought it did pretty good. Uh, it's, you know, let's face it, there's one reality we have to face up to on the left, right? It doesn't matter where you are on the political spectrum, is there's now a struggle taking place globally between neoliberalism and democracy.
services, and the two are becoming incompatible each month and each year that goes past. And we have to work out which side are we going to be on? Are we going to be on the side of the free market and neoliberalism? Banks controlling everything, the IMF, Central Bank of the European, you know, and I think most people here will probably take the position, no, that's not our side. Our side's on the side of democracy and the people controlling their own destiny and controlling the banks, not the banks controlling us. And I just keep going back to the same point. London and government is lost to neoliberalism. It has controlled Westminster, it controls the three political parties, the entire system is completely corrupted. The banks controlled the Labour government and Gordon Brown, the first thing he did was invite the bankers in. Rupert Murdoch, he decided the policy on Iran and on Iraq and the invasion. It's completely controlled by neoliberalism. And now they're in control again, this time the banking wing under Osborne. There's no, you cannot, all your visions of federalism, all your visions of social democracy, social justice, they don't exist in the London system when power resides in London. It's a pipe dream for Scotland. And the part, I'm not going to slide off Neil or Mike or any of the people in the Labour Party for the simple reason. When we vote yes, we're all going to be on the same side in 2016. I want to hear from you guys. It's what your policies in the Scottish Labour Party will be for an independent Scotland. And because I think they're going to be quite similar, maybe even to the left of the SNP. And if that's the case, I'll be voting for you. Chances are I'll vote for the SNP and the Greens because they're much closer to my politics. But this is the way the politics will, will realign. And I made the point about this SNP. The SNP policies will not be the policies of an independent Scotland. For the simple reason, once independence is taken away, from their entire reason to be, what are they left with? How are they different from the Lib Dems? How are they different from the Labour Party? <coughs> yes, on some issues, especially on Trident, it's a good progressive one, especially on sending our troops abroad. But economically, are we going to vote? Are we as a Scottish people going to vote for a party that's going to lower cooperation tax and create great inequality? Do you honestly believe that's what the Scots are going to do? Because think about this, I'll just leave you on this point. In the last election in 2011, 80% of the Scots voted for the Labour Party, the SNP and the Greens. Social Democratic and to the left, you know, on the broad scale. Can you name any other country in Europe where that happens? Our values are different from England. And this is something you have to get through into your heads. The, the values in England which elected a Tory government, they don't, we don't have them. We've got different social values. And that's why we've got an opportunity to make a difference in Scotland. And I think it will have a good effect on England. I think the working class of England and the people at the bottom of the, are going to look at us with, at the moment with free prescriptions because we're different from England. We don't pay tuition fees. We're different from England. The NHS has been taken back to the point of need for the people, which has not happened in England. It's been privatised. And we go even further as an independent country and have social values that represent the people then we're going to take the people, the working class of England with it. With it. I've already heard people from the north of England say, fuck's sake, can we come with you? Why can't, why can't the north of Yorkshire come with the independence? Well, you, you'll have the opportunity to change it because politics is going to change. I, I'm not going to, I, try, I deliberately avoided attacking the Labour Party, attacking any of the parties because it doesn't matter. This is about democracy we're voting for. It's not about the political parties. The political party thing is over until the referendum in 2014. Then a normal service resumed in 2016, whether it's yes or no. So everything, everything that Neil said about the SNP is a total red herring.
Well, um, both speakers were introduced tonight, but I recognize the sources of, of both speakers. But they're both projecting into the future, you know, um, something that's very unreal. I mean, Kevin says, needn't worry about the S&P. It's only voting in 2004. It's 2014. We'll have 2016. What I see in 2016 is a Tory party, a Lib Dem party, a Labour party, an SNP, which are all support monarchy, all pro-NATO, all, yeah, you know, all uh, actually for aspects of austerity uh, uh, policies. So actually, we're not going to have a lot of choice then. So really, what it means is if we really want to change, and I might add, I am for the break of the UK, I'm a Republican through and through, I am in favor of challenges, but if we really want to actually have to look at our parties as they exist just now. When I hear somebody, and my friend was from the back saying, it's about left losing confidence. You know, those that are moving to the, this idea of breaking up the UK. So I say, well, okay, where are the confident left in the Labour Party? They couldn't even get a candidate for the leadership election last year in Scotland. They got a candidate in England, but they could get no backing for it. That was the reality there. If we had had the Labour government re elected, as the Guardian said, we would deliver the worst cuts than even Thatcher. Man also said, I'm going to privatise the postals. That was the reality of the Labour Party. I don't do that just time, I'm just saying the SP, you can see where it's one of the team. After 2014, it's not just we've opened the pencil, we vote for negotiations which will be conducted by the SP. The SP is nothing to worry about. We support the monarchy. NATO, we're moving on board. All of these things. The City of London can run these things. So the left really has to think beyond that. And particularly in the city. Uh, you know, we've raised in East London some of our councils by Labour in uh, coalition with the Tories. In Edinburgh, Labour in coalition with the SNP and both intend delivering massive cuts in this city. So we've got an independent voice outside of these two or in, outside of this if we want to change things. Thank you. Um, Kevin Wood, 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 Kevin I'm interested in a slight contradiction I sense in what you said between the idea that it's not about cultural identity and the idea that came through in your last speech that somehow Scottish people are inherently morally better and will resist <laughs> the intrusion of banks and money and so forth. Isn't, isn't a small nation more vulnerable to the influence of large corporations, to, the, to its survival being based on the fortunes of large corporations? I was going to take one more exactly. And the gentleman behind the deal. Yeah. <coughs> I'd just like to say that it's incumbent, if this is a discussion about where the left is, it's incumbent on those people who are active in, or who are politically active in the left to go back to basic principles of agitation, education, and organization, and not to spend time in the rooms complaining about the large political parties. Yep. Should they not be knocking on doors and convincing people of their position and developing uh, a response to the SNP Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats? Isn't that the purpose of the left? Another thing that I have to say is, despite both Neil and Kevin saying it, people seem to be forgetting that after independence, it is not the current political party, some of whose leaders will be dead, who will dictate the nature of the country. It's the way in which the citizens of this country vote that will dictate the nature of this country. Therefore, it is again incumbent on every political activist of every political colour in queue to actively organise, educate and agitate for what they think should be the future of this country. But accepting the democratic principle that the people of this country, when independent, will elect the government that they wish, as they did last year, as they did in 2007, as they did in 2003, in 1999, at every election since the Universal Franchise was created. Uh, I'll pick up the idea that Hannah said that a small country is more vulnerable in the face of neoliberalism. But in actual fact, we've got an experiment going on in Europe just now, in Iceland, where Iceland was crushed by three banks that were privatized in 2000. They, you know, you know the story, they overextended themselves by 10 times GDP and they brought the country to its knees. But what we've seen in Iceland is unbelievable. 
We've watched our people and our country. It's only 450,000 people live there, not much more than the size of Edinburgh. We've watched them rebuild their economy. We've watched them not only tackling the banks, but they're now prosecuting the bankers in a way that's never happened in Ireland or Britain in any other of countries. They're crowdsourcing their constitution. They're regalvanizing the democracy. And people are actually moving back to Iceland. It's an experiment. You can watch it for yourself. You can go over there. And it proves that small countries, when you, when you create a, a robust democracy with, with the support of the people, you can challenge neoliberalism. Anyone who's got defeatism in the face of neoliberalism isn't he watching Iceland and isn't he got self-confidence in our own working people? And that takes to do the same goes with the question of the trade unions. Trade unions are organised on pay conditions, etc. No matter whether it's in Scotland or Britain, they'll fight wherever they've got to fight. You know, public service unions, which should all be fighting on a national basis against the Tory government on everything. They're not doing it at the moment because they're too big and unwieldy. I think they'll become more compact in Scotland. I think, you know, there's a, when they're, you know, the trade unions are certainly, they're totally bureaucratized. I don't see trade unions doing any fight back against anybody. And I'm not going to put my faith in the trade unions. I put my faith in the workforce and standing up when necessary, but not in the trade unions. You know, the trade union in Ireland, you know, Ireland's gone through this, but the trade unions still organize on an all Ireland basis in a lot of the cases. It's never broke, you know, the independence that for the south of Ireland didn't break up the trade unions. It's a, it's a red herring. There's going to be loads of red herrings in the independence debate. And it's just a case of, you know, methodically explaining them as they come up one by one. And always finishing on, what's your vision for Scotland and how are you going to achieve it within the British state for an independent Scotland? Because, as Joe Strummer says, the future is unwritten. And that's a fact. I can't tell you what Scotland will be like when it's independent because we don't know what it's up to the people themselves. It's a, I think I'm probably a former friend of many people in here. Uh, Jim Moynihan uh, has written a poem and uh, his catch line for it is There's nothing more device, divisive than a call for left wing unity, which I think is probably right enough. Um, and what you'll find is that I would almost guarantee that when you leave here tonight, online, on Twitter, on websites, I will be destroyed by the Cybermans. I will be personally vilified, I will have things said about me that are despicable, absolutely despicable. I've had it already. I've had it already. I've had the lies that people say about people who oppose independence. It's absolutely, it's appalling. And I respectfully say to the left in the SAP, that is no way to win the argument, tearing strips off people's character and personally vilifying them. And I would appeal to, you know, if, if you know people are involved in that, please tell me to stop because it's, it is actually doing you more damage than you will ever believe. And we see it in Parliament as well. If people stand up and speak and defend, you know, people who defend the union and all the rest of or defend whatever position, they're called anti-Scottish. I'm not anti-Scottish. I'm as Scottish as them. Don't ever let anybody, I'll not let anybody ever say that I'm anti-Scottish. And that's, what, that's what's happening within this debate. It's becoming poisonous and it's becoming personal. In terms of, um, uh, we, we spoke about uh, the, the, the trade unions and, and, and whatever. Um, I think if we divide the trade union movement, we will be weaker. I think that's absolutely, there's no question of that. Um, and I think that's a real danger. And Kevin mentioned Ireland. What we have in Ireland is an absence of class politics in Ireland. It's nationalist argument between each other about what version of nationalism we want. There isn't any class politics there. So I think there's a danger there that the vision that you have that suddenly after independence it'll all be back to normal when I have serious reservations about that. Finally, about the corporations. The message just now is that Scotland's open for business, guys. Come in and fill your boots. I mean, the likes of Amazon and the, I mean, the polling organisations, I don't know if anybody here works for them. Um, but from what I'm hearing from the friends in Fife, some of the work practices and what, what they're actually up to there are really very, very poor. And yet, within Parliament, when you talk about the economy, 
First Minister rhymes off Amazon as one of the great inward investment success stories. It ain't, it simply isn't. So, that's the, the, the issues that come together. Gentlemen, very back to the question. My name's Tom Barton. I'm the gentleman in the book. You're the young comrade. I'm Mark from Socialist Appeal, a member of the Prospect Trade Union, civil service. My pay's going down twenty pounds a month, not much, but uh, till that's two hundred and fifty a year because the pension increase, and that's not just hit us in Scotland, that's hit us nationally uh, by the Tory government. And I think that uh, we against that is to draw the lessons of every struggle and every experience that workers have got. We are they are. I'm a bit surprised, Kevin, when you say there was different social values in England. Maybe I misheard that at the back. But I do agree with you that we've got to link the fight to workers. And, and here's the answer to that. If you can buy the pamphlet for me later on, the <laughs> electricians, the members, mainly electricians in the United Union in London, had a successful fight back against the attempts by the seven big building companies eh, to break the national agreement because the workers organised. And what we're having the discussion about tonight is a lack of leadership in the uh, movement. That's the problem. It's not a lack of opportunity. Sure, we're not the heady days of 1984 and 85, or the poll tax. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're going to go that way. We're going to take the great road. And I accept that uh, the Commons want a peaceful and uh, prosperous Scotland. As James Connolly pointed out all those years ago, you can run down the Union Jack and fly and run up the Green Flag Island and let it fly over Dublin Castle. But Britain will still rule you through its banks, through its companies, through its landlords, all these ways. And that's why they call for a social transformation rather than a political change of, of government is, is what's needed here. It's got to be a third one, Chief. You've got to not just fiddle about with your tax uh, increases and such like. You've got to control the banks, you've got to control the multinationals. It wouldn't make a bit of difference whether the government's in uh, Holyrood or in London. Unless we take over the multinationals and the banks and run them in a planned manner for the interests of everyone, and that means workers' control, then we're, we're talk, talking hot air here. That's basically it. By the way, Neil, I'm also in the southwest end of the Labour Party, and I can tell you, it doesn't take anything to push them to the right wing. But they are all ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The unions will move first, and they're through the unions because, as you say, the links for the unions and the Labour Party. That will push the Labour Party to the left, and we'll see a return to the big class valves, but in whatever accent eh, the workers are. Thank you. Thank you. And the young gentleman in front. Please don't speak yet. Yeah. Oh, right. Sorry. Um, I just want to go back to the chairman. Stand up, Raymond Brown. Yeah. I'm also from social security. Power in London, you said, was controlled by international capital, as if that's the home of capitalism. But as far as I know, it's international capital also controls Madrid, Athens, Paris, Berlin, and Edinburgh. I don't see what your point was there when you're saying that Scotland will be free from London international capital, international capital every day. I work for an international company. You know what I mean? They're here and they're here now. If we want to get rid of that, we want to achieve socialism. We're going to have to build some kind of movement here, a movement that addresses that problem and doesn't distract us from the main fact, which is that we're all making uh, a pay for this in order to pay for the capital prices that have been produced here. So, I'd also like to ask you as well, is there something about the English, Welsh or Irish workers that are not uh, radical, not socialist, and we can't build something with them? You know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, international capital is as powerful as it's going to be. It's always going to be powerful, you know, regardless of whether Scotland or Britain is uh, one country or the other. At the end of the day, they're going to remain as powerful billionaires with their means as they have. And the only thing that we've got is unity and power by unity. And at the end of the day, the more that we build together, the more of the legions that we've got down in England, the workers who are as pissed off as I am, as pissed off as many of us in the room. There are, there are brothers and sisters, they can help us fight and change society properly. At the end of the day, you're asking us to turn our backs on Thank you. Gerrit Duncan, lifelong trade unionist. Um, let me first of all say that congratulations to the people that organised this, because hopefully this is the first 
of myriad these debates that will take place, and I'm glad they seem to be conducted in that, that kind of fashion. But let me pick up one or two points. I mean, I think the two sides of the argument, from Kevin we hear a vision, a vision of hope. You know, a vision that says, this is what may happen in an independent spot. This is our opportunity by voting yes to take things forward. I'm afraid, Neil, you know, while I greatly respect your position, and if the Labour Party was formed when the Neil Finley was formed, I think we would all be there anyway. But the fact of the matter is, your contribution reflected actually what you said in the Morbid Star a couple of months back. And it was about what you would like the United States you want to achieve in the UK. And speaking as a trade unionist, there's been, you know, a few comments made about the, the, the trade unions. And I take great umbrage to this idea that we would be somehow deserting our comrades down south by declaring Scotland an independent country. You know, over all my years as a trade unionist, I have supported comrades not only in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, but right across the world, currently the Spanish miners. So this idea that we somehow wrap ourselves in a tarp blanket and shut ourselves off our world is absolute nonsense. And I find it, honestly, I find it despicable that people would even uh, comment on that. The crucial thing for me in this debate is the hope that the referendum gives us, the achievement of a yes vote. We do so nobody is going to get on that, you know, we've watched Alex Salmon fraternising with all these people, you know, Donald Trump, the latest of them, um, which is probably the reason why we formed the, the group Trade Unionists for Independence. Because we need to have a voice, the left has to have a voice within that, and, and a non party political one within the, the yes campaign, within the fight for the yes vote. Because if we're suddenly going to go along and, you know, let's get rid of one thing as well, let's get rid of this idea of a second vote. Because for me, the second vote would give us the, the worst of both worlds. Yes, it would give us a race to the bottom, you know, without a shadow of doubt, absolutely agree, whole half uh, corporation tax would, would plummet. But you see, as you said yourself, corporation tax is going to go as low as 10% of the UK anyway. So where is our fight back with that? Are we suddenly going to produce a Labour government? Because this is our biggest hope. This is the only hope that you can hold out for us. We can produce a Labour government to the left. Are we really being serious about that? Come on. We had 13 years of a Labour government. I'll tell you as a trade unionist, not one iota of the anti-trade union legislation throughout the 80s was repealed, other than GCHQ, and even they were wrong, by the way, you can't use the ultimate tool. So let's not kid ourselves on. What you are hoping to achieve can never, ever be achieved in the UK. However, there is hope within an independent Scotland, and that's why these meetings are absolutely necessary. But on somebody quoted Conway, let me uh, remind you of what Conway also said, of course. Keep your rifles, because the big fight will come. And that's why the left have to get together now. Whether independence happens in 2014, 2016 or not, it is going to happen. And unless we start organising as a left, we're handing the tools of the trade to Alex Salmon and people like that. We have to start organising. That's why this debate is crucial and hopefully we many more. Thank you very much. Very, very quick. Uh, my name's Sean Allen. I'm not in any political party. I thought I'd keep you really to listen tonight rather than speak. There was something that the lawyer that I said that just sparked a wee thought in my head. Uh, he mentioned something about people voting for, for a government that they actually want. Uh, I turned 18 in January 93, and I'm too old to see now to work out the arithmetic to tell you how long ago that was, but it was a long time ago. And my first, the first general election was that May, May 83. And in that, in that election, in every election since then, I've voted for a Labour government. And sometimes I've got that, and sometimes I haven't. But I've never once, not for a single day, lived under a government that I thought represented me, or helped me, or supported me. It's a government that's either attacked my principles and those of my colleagues and other working class people round about me, or it sold my socialist principles out. And unfortunately, that's including Labour governments as well. And I can't see that changing. I can't ever see that changing under the status quo. 
And the only reason that I'm going to be voting for independence this time around is because that might change. Not because it will. I, I'm just going to, I want to give myself the chance I might be able to live under a government that does represent me, uh, does represent my principles, uh, and that's why I'll be voting for independence. Can I say the most telling point tonight, I think, is Derek's point. We need more of these debates, we need more discussion. Because it, it's not happening across the country. We're getting too much involved in the slagging match and we're not getting into the detail because that's how people will make their mind up. The emotional appeal, some people get caught up with. But for some people it will be, what's going to happen to my pension? What's going to happen to my son is that, you know, is in a job and all that kind of stuff? You only get to that through discussion, debate, and detail. So I think absolutely, and I think it's been great. It's been really good. People have been very uh, measured in their contributions, and long may that continue. Um, Derek spoke about um, the he thinks there'd be a chance he has moving in, that, in, in a different direction under independence. You know, I think there probably is a chance. As much as a chance as there is remaining in the UK, because you ask yourself, you ask yourself, do you think it's in the interest of working people <coughs> that the Peter de Vinks of this world are standing there cheering for independence? Is, does he have the same vision as you? Of course he does not. So therefore, they have got a vision of the type of Scotland that they've got in mind. And I'll tell you what, Derek, it ain't your vision of Scotland. That's for that's absolutely for sure. Um, my friend at the back mentioned the pensions dispute, <coughs> and uh, I don't try not to make party political points, but the one point is who was on the right side of the picket line at the pensions dispute? That's all, I'll leave it to that. And the electricians, <coughs> you know, when there was a picket line in Parliament, who stayed out and who went in? That tells you something about the direction of travel within the government party. And then the electricians dispute, I was heavily involved in that. And that was an example in the UK trade union movement delivering a massive victory against big business, Balfour Beatty. And if they hadn't done it together, the Scottish trade union, the Scottish United could never have achieved that without the hit squads in London attacking the, uh, stop, stopping production on the Olympic Park, the underground and all the rest of it. Only with the UK trade union movement worked together, they achieved that victory. And that, I think, is indisputable. Um, and somebody else mentioned about um, the, the Labour Party and its direction and how we're all moving in the right direction and all the rest of it. The trade unions just now have got the most left-wing leadership they've had in generations. McCluskey, Dave Prentice, Paul Kenny. The unions are moving. They are moving. Bob Crow not affiliated to the Labour Party, but these are people who are moving in a particular direction in their organisation. The Knights are transformed union in Scotland and across the UK. They are the, the, the hope that we have to move the Labour Party in the direction that I want it to be, and I think we're starting to move in the right direction. Yeah, I don't have much to say. I think the most telling thing tonight, we've been debating for two hours, was Neil started off hostile in opposition to Scottish independence and now he's moved to serious reservations. Just give it a two years and you'll see them all moving the girls. <laughs> that apart, you know, I, you know, I can't promise anything because we've got nothing to promise. Well, there's, if you're a working person, you get nothing without struggle. This is just a fact of life. You cannot take on the banks and, the, and you can't take on the rich, you can't, you can't change your communities unless you're prepared to stand up and fight for it. So independence is not going to solve everything, it's going to solve nothing. And all it's going to do is give us the tools <coughs> with which we can use and try and fight with to try and make our society a better place to live. And that's all it is, it's the democratic tools, which we don't have as long as we're part of the UK. I would just say one of the things is that as this debate progresses, one of the things I totally agree with Neil, I'm not impressed with cyber nights who go around abusing people who are on the other side. It doesn't impress me at all. I think they're doing damage to our cause. I also think that people, every time 
you know, I, you know, we all know what like Mr. Fouts is like. He sits there, he puts things up on Twitter, and everybody goes mad, and you know, he's just winding them up. And it's like there has to be a little bit more discipline here. There has to be a little bit more vision and on the question of ideas. This isn't about Brits versus Nats. What this is about is ideas. It's a battle of ideas and how to make these ideas express themselves in a way that working people can use them to better their lives. And that's why I think all of those negativity, we should all abandon it. We should stop, you know, I think we should personalize the attacks, you know. We shouldn't personalize attacks on each other or on the political parties because it's not about parties anymore. It's about democracy and power and where it lies. And that's why <coughs> over the next few months, we're going to fight this campaign in a very, very different way from any political campaign that's ever been held in this country. In other words, from our side, and I know this, having spoken with people involved in the Yes campaign, we're not going to fight it through the media. Yes, Alex Salmon will do his stuff. What we're going to do is we're going to fight this at a grassroots level by getting people to articulate the vision. And that's why, as far as I'm concerned, in this campaign, Wins is going to be in Leith. And I'm hoping that anybody here who wants to get involved in that campaign, not in an organisational structure, but just to be able to sit down and discuss with me about some of the best ways of putting forward the ideas and also some of the ways of uh, questions that you might not be sure about, the questions that come up, let's do it that way. Because that's how we're going to fight this. And the, the election, the campaign will be won in 2014. I don't think it will be won in 2013. I think there's going to be a big shift one way or the other in 2014. People will be thinking it through. And if you make a tit of yourself by abusing everybody else, you're going to do nobody a favour on either side. And that's the reality. Like So, you know, bear that in mind. And if you've already made up your mind, jump on board. And know what the S campaign is going to decide. And uh, hopefully some of us can work at least to try and build a real base for the S campaign. Take a side, take a view, engage in it. You're shaping the future of your country. And I, and I, I do uh, take the gratitude to both speakers. I want to thank all of you for coming. I think the People's Festival has been so encouraged by this that we'll certainly do our opportunity, do our best to ensure that there's other platforms for people to come together. And I have to say, those differences between the speakers, both them and us here, have conducted themselves in the best traditions of the left. There's not been any slagging, there's not been any say that's been unduly offensive. I hope most speakers would agree with that. And it's in tradition to the left that we try and lighten debate with rational argument and logic and facts and figures. And I have to say, I sit on the Yes Scotland advisory board. I'm not going to say anything about that. I think the speakers are covering Kevin's more than amply say what I would say uh, for independence. But clearly, the Yes campaign is a movement. And the no campaign is a movement. I, I, I happen to shake this guy's hand as, you know, I don't even know who he was. He comes over and shakes my hand to take a picture and turns out he's a Tory councillor in Midlothian who stood as an independent in Mayfield because he knew if he'd stood as a Tory, he'd get strung up with a lap post. So, <laughs> anyway, so, so it's a self evident truth that the Yes campaign is a movement, it has its right, it has its left. <coughs> I like to see myself part of that rather than the, left, the right or the centre. And clearly it's also the case that the No campaign is a movement of left, right and centre. And also, when you have Tories, the Union of Britain is backed by the British state. And it's self-evident truth, you've got a left, right and centre there too. So I think it's been a terrific debate. I hope that people, I just want to say this, if I want to... I hope, no, no, I know, I know, I know. I'm just going to say, I hope, and the will wind up the meeting, I hope that if you've enjoyed tonight's debate, you remember it's the Edinburgh People's Festival and I hope you'll join. I hope you get involved. There's membership forms at the back. 
and I hope you'll get involved to make sure the Edinburgh Beatles Festival itself grows and develops for here. Thank you. Thank you.